Hi, I'm Jeff Todd, President and CEO at Prevent Blindness. Welcome to our Focus on Eye Health Expert Series. Today we have joining us Peter Holland, the Chief Executive for the International Agency for the Prevention of Blindness. Hi, Peter. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Jeff. Thanks very much for inviting me. Um, you know, Prevent Blindness is um, certainly proud to be a member of the International Agency for the Prevention of Blindness, or IAPB. Could you tell us a little bit about your organization and the role that it plays in bringing stakeholders across the globe together around vision and eye health? Sure. Um, so uh, IPB, the International Agency for the Prevention of Blindness, we're, we're the essentially the overarching alliance for the global eye, eye health sector. Um, we're a membership organization. We've got over 180 members worldwide. Um, drawn from the non-governmental sector, from corporate organizations, academic institutions, eye care hospitals, and professional bodies. So we really represent the whole sector, and we're present really, or our members are present really everywhere around the world. We do three broad things. We advocate on behalf of the sector, particularly at a global level with global institutions like the United Nations and the World Health Organization. We try to connect the sector in terms of sharing knowledge, so we publish the Vision Atlas, which is probably the most comprehensive source of data and information about global eye care. And then we try and bring the sector together and build partnerships across the sector because we firmly believe the challenges we face, we can't do uh, individually. We're going to have to work together to, to solve them. Great. Thank you. And, and you mentioned the United Nations. So a major step forward in addressing this problem is the recent passage of a United Nations Resolution on Eye Health titled Vision for Everyone. Could you tell us a bit about um, what this resolution sets forth? Sure. Um, well, I guess the first thing about the resolution is it's actually the first ever resolution on vision at the United Nations. Actually, I think it might indeed be virtually the first time that vision and eye health have really ever been discussed as a major global issue at the United Nations. So it was a really, for us anyway, it was a really big landmark event um, it does a number of things. Firstly, and I think really importantly, it, um, it explicitly links vision and eye health with over half of the sustainable development goals, uh, including those on ending poverty, quality education, gender equity, decent work and economic growth, so a whole range of the, the, the sustainable development goals. And uh, in particular, it calls on member states to provide access to services to the currently 1.1 billion people who've got vision impairment sight loss and currently don't have access to the eye care services they need. And it calls on them to do that by 2030. And it sets out a number of actions for them to do. So for governments, it encourages governments to, to take a whole of government approach to eye health and link eye vision to other development priorities. For donors and funding institutions, it essentially calls on them to increase funding for eye health. So that's a really important message coming from the UN. And, and again, related to that with the UN institutions to make sure that they integrate eye care and eye health as part of their program of work. And also importantly, it recognizes the role of civil society. So it recognizes our role across the world and private sector and academic institutions in supporting governments to achieve the, the goal. So it's a really comprehensive kind of cover of, of the eye health agenda, but linking it importantly to these global sustainable development goals. Great. Um, well, you know, such, such a monumental achievement couldn't have come easy. I know you guys played an instrumental role in this. What did it take to get Vision and Eye Health the recognition it deserves on such a prominent stage? Um, well, I mean, firstly, it was, a, it was an absolutely huge partnership effort across a whole range of people and organizations really took part over, over a few years. But I mean, crucially, the resolution was spearheaded by the UN Friends of Vision who are a group of ambassadors and diplomats at the United Nations who were committed to the UN. And crucially, it was led by the co-chairs there, Ambassador Aubrey Webson from Antigua and Barbuda, Ambassador Rabab Fatima from Bangladesh, and Ambassador Geraldine byrne Nathan um, from Ireland. And, and I, I really would want to pay tribute to them because actually without their leadership and really extraordinary commitment, it wouldn't have happened. But actually they were supported. There are over, there are over 50 countries involved in the UN Friends, Friends of Vision. One thing that strikes me, I, I've been a diplomat before, I've been to UN meetings. Many of them are not the most exciting um, sessions that you go to, 
when I when I first went to the UN, I, 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 when I went to the UN Friends of Vision, what was really striking right from the outset was the sort of personal involvement that many of these very senior diplomats brought. You know, this wasn't an issue they were doing because they were being told they had to be there. It actually, people were there because they really felt it was important, and, and that I think is one of the crucial reasons why why we got the resolution. But I think also, you know, it was the efforts of of uh, of our IPB members across the board in terms of supporting this also made a huge difference in terms of lobbying governments to get them on board. We have a secretariat group which supports the Friends of Vision, which includes a number of our members, CBM, One Site, Site Savers, Fred Hollis Foundation, Vision Council of America, Vision Spring, who played a crucial role. And also I've mentioned James Chen, who was quite inspirational in helping set up the UN Friends of Vision at the, at the, the beginning. But also then, you know, people like yourselves who played a really crucial role in lobbying governments to get on board when the negotiations were going on. I think one, one lesson I draw from the effort is, is around actually having the audacity to, to go for something like this. It, the UN Friends of Vision didn't exist three years ago. The first meeting was in October 2018. And I think at that point, if you'd sort of suggested that in three years time, there was going to be a UN resolution on vision, people would have looked, you know, pretty askance actually at, at us at the idea. But actually, you know, this was a big objective and we went for it, we had the support and actually we found that people really were committed to it. That went all the way through. Only a few weeks ago, when we we're getting close to the end, um, Ambassador Webson said, right, I want 100 countries co-sponsoring this resolution. And we sort of looked at him and thought, have you gone mad? How are we going to get 100 countries? And actually, we got 115 co-sponsors. Uh, and, and I think it's a kind of lesson in, you know, if you have that ambition, in the oldest audacity to go for it, you can actually can actually get it. Yeah, I was certainly impressed with how how swiftly, you know, in the scheme of things, this this advanced. Uh, you, you connected um, the resolution to the sustainable development goals. Would you share a little bit more about what those are and how vision integrates into them? Sure. So um, there, there are 17 sustainable development goals. They're the heart of what's called the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It's really the kind of guiding agenda for the United Nations on a whole range of development issues in terms of tackling poverty, economic growth, education, health, inequality. Um, it was agreed in 2015 and it runs through to 2030. Um, and, and one of the things that became apparent is that there's really quite strong evidence um, and this was particularly pulled out by the Lancet Global Commission on Eye Health, which was published earlier this year, that vision and eye health are really crucial to achieving over half of the goals. Um, so, and, and one of the things though that happened when the, the sustainable development goals were negotiated was that they come with something like 170 targets and I think something like 5,000 actions. So a huge range of activity. Eye health wasn't mentioned at all. It was left out of the original agenda with the sustainable development goals, even though, I mean, it's pretty obvious that you can't achieve your goals on poverty and education and, and, and so on without actually getting eye health there. So this is, this is partly addressing the omission. And just some of the examples, um, the, so, and this is the evidence that came out of the Lancet was, you know, for example, vision loss costs the global economy, uh, something in the region of $411 billion every year and just in lost productivity. Um, so it says a huge impact on, on economic growth and that obviously has an impact on poverty and hunger. In terms of health, I mean, obviously, eye health is a crucial part of health, but one thing that people probably don't, aren't, aren't nearly as aware of is that actually poor eye health increases the risk of mortality by up to 2.6 times. So it's not just the impact on eye health, it's the impact on wider health issues. In terms of education, there are 91 million people around the world who've got vision impairment but don't have access to the eye care services they need. And we know that in lower and middle income countries, children who've got vision loss are something like two to five times less likely to be in formal education. So it has a real impact on their ability to, to go to school. In terms of, I've talked about productivity, but we know again that if you provide evidence shows that if you provide glasses in the workplace, it can increase productivity between 20 and 30%. So it, it cuts across all these goals. And I think that's really the crucial point about the resolution is the 
importance of vision and eye health to achieving this very broad global agenda on development. Indeed, you can't do it unless you've got good eye health. I think that's such such an essential point to this whole thing. Um, and, and those of us in eye care understand how connected eye health is to so many other things, but it's a challenge to get the broader community to recognize that. So I think that's yeah. a, a huge, huge step for this. So, yeah, so and I think people take it past people... now um, and we're all celebrating that, but that's just the first step. So what now, how will this get implemented? Yeah, so deep breath. <laughs> and, uh, but no, I mean, absolutely. It's it's uh, it's uh, you know it's very much a first step. Um, and 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 I think you know we have to have a plan over the decades to to really get the uh, that you know that one point one billion target achieved. Um, I think firstly, it's actually a great example of the first challenge we face, which is sort of the challenge you were talking about just now, because. Actually, I think people often take eyes for granted and don't really think about it. So one of the challenges we have is really to elevate eye health up the agenda, get it on decision makers agenda and make them recognize that it matters. And I think having the resolution will be really helpful with us being able to engage governments at a national level. Essentially, they've signed up to this at the UN. So it gives us a tool to go to government and say, look, you've signed up to it. How are you gonna, you now need to get on and implement it. And you can then make the case about eye health isn't just a healthcare issue, actually it's got all these links to everything else that, that governments are trying to achieve. Uh, there's also gonna be a mechanism, I think, to hold them to account. So actually within the resolution, there are a couple of targets, which are the targets that were agreed at the World Health Assembly earlier this year on cataracts and refractive error. And those targets are also within the resolution and calling them to be included as part of the targets around, uh, around achieving the sustainable development goals. So actually, you've got essentially a, a kind of accountability tool. And, and, and again, within the resolution, there's a mechanism for measuring that because every year countries report on their progress on the sustainable development goals. And again, it calls on vision to be included in those reports. So we've got those accountability tools there. I think a second element around this is one of the critical themes of the resolution is around integration and calling on governments to take a whole of government approach. I think firstly for us, you know, at a country level, we want to support the effort to integrate eye health as part of mainstream health services. And that's obviously a message that's come out of the World Health Organization, importantly. But actually, it's not just within mainstream health services. So you need to think about the partnerships and how we integrate with other sectors, whether that's education to ensure you've got school eye health programs, or for example, with employers, if you've got such strong evidence about the impact on productivity, then I think there's a real case to be made to employers that actually it's worth their while and it's in their interest to actually make sure their employees have got access to to eye care services and then i think thirdly um, it obviously allows us to make the case to your own institutions and again that's written into the resolution but it allows us to go to the unicef the international labor organizations undp to say make sure that eye health properly within your your programs and you can potentially take that to economic institutions as well so, for example, to argue, uh, to make the case to reduce taxes and tariffs on glasses, which we know can be can mean that you make them unaffordable. So, you, you know, you can go to use it to go and make the case that you should reduce those, tar those tariffs. So, I mean, it is a big agenda, but I think it's going to be, we hope, it'll prove a really useful tool in terms of really pushing, pushing that agenda forward. Great, thank you. Uh, you know, while, while Prevent Blindness certainly sees ourselves as a part of the global eye health community, we do have a decidedly US-centric mission. I'm curious how you think this resolution will be able to help more developed countries such as ours or yours, um, Great Britain. And alternatively, um, how can countries like the US contribute to the advancements of the IAPB and, and the UN goals? Yeah, I mean, so the, the resolution applies to everybody. It's not just a resolution aimed at lower and middle income countries. So we know that you know, 90% of people with sight loss because they don't have access to eye care live in lower and middle income countries, but that still means 10% live in, in higher income countries in the US and in the UK, for example, that's over hundred million people. So there are a lot of people who still live in higher income countries. So the resolution and its recommendations apply as much to us and people who live in our countries as it does to, 
to lower it, lower middle income countries as well. I think the second thing, and I mean, we've learned that obviously from the work I've done on the resolution, but we know that widely you know, across the sector, that we're not going to achieve this as individual organisations working alone. We're going to, we, you know, partnership is at the heart of this. We need to share, you know, our expertise, learning experience all the way across the sector. And a lot of that goes on. And there's obviously a lot of expertise that exists within US institutions that can be enormously valuable to uh, uh, organisations elsewhere as well. And so we really encourage and, and we, you know, we hold events, I know, like you do, to, to, to share that, that knowledge and learning. And equally, actually, frankly, there's learning I know, I know for, certainly for in the UK, there's a lot we can learn from institute, organizations elsewhere as well. Um, uh, and and so, so that learning goes, really goes both, both ways. And the third thing, and bluntly, it's resources and funding and commitment. Um, the US actually played a really active part in the negotiations, which was great. And it's really important that they were heavily involved, but you know, we need the resources to do it. Um, uh, and the US and USAID play a really important, do, do fund programs which, is, which are really important. I, on a personal note coming from the UK, I have to say, it's been really disappointing that the UK has withdrawn its funding from the programs to eliminate trachoma and onchocerciasis, particularly as, you know, with the funding we, that was that would have been there, we were really on track to eliminate them over the next decade. And there's now a hole there. The US has been, been a really important funder of those programs. And so obviously we hope continues to play that, that really crucial role and perhaps twist the arm of my government to, uh, to, uh, to, to put some of that funding back. But, but actually that, that role in terms of, uh, you know, of, of providing resources is really important as well. So, so Peter, we're about a month away from World Psych Day, which takes place this year on October 14th. I know that IAPB and many of your member organizations, including my own, Prevent Blindness, have plans throughout the month. Would you talk a little bit about what this year's World Psych Day plans are? Sure. Well, we're ambitious here as well. We want, we want this year's World Psych Day but to be the, the biggest World Psych Day ever. Um, and actually, we want to then keep growing World Sight Data so it becomes a really global, uh, global event. I guess it's the, it's the real opportunity that the sector has to talk to the wider general public. And as we were talking about earlier, um, you know, I think often people take their eyes and eye health for granted. So this is a real opportunity to get it in the forefront of people's minds. So that's what we're, what, so, so that's our emphasis is to really talk outside the sector and engage people who wouldn't necessarily think about their eyes at other times of the year. So the theme this year is love your eyes. Uh, and it very, it deliberately starts from the point of view of the individual. And we're wanting people to go and get their eyes tested and, and just start from, from eye screening. We're aiming, we have a target of at least a million eye tests during the month before World Sight Day. Uh, and we're looking for individuals or organizations to pledge their tests towards achieving this target. So anyone can do that. An individual can pledge going, pledge going to have an eye test. An organization that provides eye tests can come and pledge the eye test they're giving during that month to, to that. And we would encourage as many people as possible to sign up. And then on World Sight Day, what we want to do is have a sort of global event that spans the kind of full 24 hours where we bring members together and hold eye tests in a whole range of unusual and profile, high profile locations. So I think we've got test plans on Brooklyn Bridge and Santa Barbara Beach, and I think the base camp of Mount Everest amongst others. So a whole range of different places. And, and again, if people have got ideas for exciting places to, to hold a test, that would be brilliant. Uh, and, and it's really about, you know, getting people involved and getting that public en uh, engagement. And obviously, as you say, you've got your plans and many of our member organizations have their own plans. But uh, if you want more information from us, go to our website, ipb.org. That's where you can sign up to pledging eye tests. And there are also contact numbers for our team for doing it. So please do get in touch with them. That's terrific. And, and I'm here today on behalf of Prevent Blindness to pledge at least 100,000 towards your million goal. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Jeff. Fantastic. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and thanks, Peter, for spending time with us today and for all that you and IPB do to gather the global eye health community.